الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وعظيمنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبا القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه الغر الميامين الحمد لله الذي جعلنا من المتمسكين بولاية سيدي ومولاي علي بن أبي طالب اللهم صل على الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله أما بعد يقول الله في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل لا أسألكم عليه أجرا إلا المودة في القربى فاست بعض الصلوات من أبو رسول الله محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم. اللهم صل على محمد. The second in honor of Amir al-Mu'minin Ali ibn Abi Talib. The third with your loudest voices in honor of the Imam of our time, Imam Sahib al-Asr wal-Zaman. Respected scholars, brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Imam Musa ibn Ja'far, salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi. Was born on the 7th of Safar, in the 128th year after Hijrah, and died on the 25th of Rajab, in the 183rd year after Hijrah, a man from whose life many a lesson may be learned and many an outstanding principle may be derived, and a man revered for his patience, his humility, his piety, as well as his justice and the stand against oppression. Imam Musa ibn Ja'far unfortunately has not been studied in the way he should be. There are many who know of his existence but not many who know about his impact. Both spiritually in terms of the legacy he left behind for the religion of Islam but at the same time in terms of his own character from which there are so many lessons that can be learned which can be applied to our everyday lives. When people go and visit his shrine in Baghdad, it is unbelievable to see the number of people who visit his shrine without knowing absolutely anything about his life. There are many who will go towards his shrine, stand there and pay their salutations and regards. But you don't see the same emotion shown by them as they show in other places of pilgrimage. And the reason is that many people do not know much about the life of Imam Musa ibn Ja'far. Had the person studied the life of Imam Musa ibn Ja'far in depth, then he would show a much greater respect and more emotion than the little emotion that is shown by people who have not studied his life. You find many who go to the shrine in Kalmain and will admit that we have been to that shrine, but we do not know much about his life. We stand there, we ask God to forgive us, we ask God to help us, without really having studied the person or the persons buried in that shrine. Therefore tonight, let us examine this man who was tortured more than any other of the Imams of Al Muhammad and see what impact his life has on our lives today. The Imam, as we said, was born on the 7th of Safar. That's why normally the Wilad or the birth of Imam Musa ibn Ja'far is hardly celebrated in our communities. 
because Safar is normally a time of grief. It's a time when the family of the Prophet were taken towards the land of Sham. And therefore, in many of our mosques, that period, the 40-day period, or in some cases, a 68-day period until the Prophet's martyrdom, you find that many of our mosques will not necessarily honor his birth. He was born on the 7th of Safar in an area by the name of al Abwa. al Abwa was between Mecca and Medina. Mufaddal bin Umar narrates that Imam al-Sadiq sallallahu wa sallamuhu alayhi had a home which was a place where he would visit on his journey for example towards Hajj or on his journey from Mecca back to Medina. Mufaddal bin Umar says this place was in an area called al Abwa. He says, I used to remember seeing Imam al-Sadiq in the middle of the hottest day, plowing the earth and working. I would say to him, Imam, a man of your knowledge and a man who everybody is willing to work for, why are you working like this? Why don't you let us do the work for you? To which our sixth Imam replied to Mufaddal by saying, and what is the shame in me earning a lawful living? Just like everybody else, there were prophets who all worked. Prophet Idris was a tailor. Prophet Musa, for example, had a job in terms of being a shepherd, let's say. Prophet Dawood used to make the iron and work with iron. Prophet Jesus was a carpenter. The Holy Prophet himself worked for Khadija. Our sixth Imam said that when I come to Al Abwa, I plow the earth so I earn a lawful living for myself as well. Just because I'm a man of knowledge does not mean I can't earn a living as well. I like you want to earn a living. I like you want to be someone who can afford to buy what you are buying as well. And you found that it was in this area, Al Abwa, that Imam al Sadiq, the narration tells us, was sitting with Abu Basir. Abu Basir said we had our breakfast. He says Imam al Sadiq used to have the most grand breakfast. As in he'd make you eat and he'd want you to eat and he'd give you all the dishes. He said all of a sudden someone came to Imam al Sadiq and said to him, Your wife Hamida is now facing the moments of labor and she wants you to be by her side. Imam al Sadiq left them. He went towards Hamida and he came back later and he said, I have glad tidings that Allah has given me the best gift and that is a son whose face resembles the face of Nabi Musa alayhi salam and therefore I have decided to name him Musa. The only Imam of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt who you find is named after a Prophet of God previous to the Holy Prophet is Imam Musa ibn Ja'far. Therefore you find Imam Musa ibn Ja'far, his father was Ja'far bin Muhammad. His mother was Hamida. Hamida was from North Africa. Someone asks the question, why would Imam al-Sadiq marry a woman from Africa? As in, doesn't Imam al-Sadiq have enough women to choose from in Medina? And on top of that, Imam al-Sadiq is a Sayyid. He's from the line of Amir al-Mu'mineen. Aren't Sayyids only married to, aren't Sayyids only meant to marry Sayyidas? Because would you believe in some of our communities today, you have some people who when their son wants to get married, if their son is a Sayyid from the line of the Prophet, they will say to him, you can only find a Sayyid like you. The son says, but dad, I found a girl who is a good girl, with good piety, with humility, with forbearance, who's generous. No, we are Sayyids, we only marry Sayyids. If Imam al-Sadiq believed in this, why did Imam al-Sadiq marry a lady from North Africa? 
Imam al-Sadiq of Izzli turned around and said, I am the son of Muhammad al-Baqir. Who is the son of Zayn al-Abideen? Who is the son of Ali ibn al-Hussein? Who is the son of Hussein? Who is the son of Ali? He could have easily, I am from that line. I have to marry only from that lineage. On the contrary, Imam al-Sadiq ends up marrying someone from North Africa. Let's say from the area between Morocco and Tunisia. Imam al-Sadiq could have easily turned around and said, I'll marry from Medina. But Imam was highlighting to us, in Islam, we do not have this thing where you only marry someone from your caste. There's no such thing. In Islam, you can marry someone who is of your religion, but of a different cultural background. Someone whose race may be different to your race. When Imam marries someone from North Africa, someone could easily turn around and say, Imam al-Sadiq, why are you marrying people of different races? We are Arabs, we only marry Arabs. On the contrary, the Imam, what was he trying to show us? The Imam was trying to show us, never reach a stage in your communities where you have an inch of racism in your ways. Imagine today in Africa, there are Africans who turn around and say to you, I am a servant of yours, but my lineage goes back to Imam Musa ibn Ja'far's mother. What does your lineage go back to? You find that that's quite a strong statement. But Imam Musa ibn Ja'far's mother is Hamida. Hamida is from North Africa. You find therefore that this Hamida, Imam al-Sadiq, used to praise her very highly. Imam al-Sadiq used to say, Hamida, Allah is pleased with her and she is pleased with whatever Allah has given her. And further than this, Imam al-Sadiq used to also say to the ladies of Medina, whenever you have a question to ask, don't ask me, ask my wife Hamida, because my wife answers in exactly the same way I answer. Imagine, Hamida can answer a question like Imam al-Sadiq. At what level must Hamida be? Do you know what level? It's when a husband and wife's relationship moves forward together. In our communities today, either the husband is too religious and the wife isn't, or the wife is too religious and the husband isn't. And what you find, unfortunately, is this causes a bit of friction at home. Sometimes the balance doesn't need to mean both of them have to be religious, but that those both of them are trying to become more and more religious. Today, sometimes what you find, one is too religious, the other isn't interested in the religion. And there becomes a friction at home. Imam al-Sadiq, when he married Hamida, he could have easily said, I'm the Imam, I'm knowledgeable, you just act as my wife. No, this wife of mine, both of us will become religious together. Both of us will gain knowledge of each other. Both of us will bounce off each other with our understanding of Islam. And then Therefore you found when you had a mother who is knowledgeable and a father who is knowledgeable, then naturally the young Imam Musa al-Kadhim would come out extremely knowledgeable. Imam Musa al-Kadhim at the age of five was teaching Abu Hanifa lessons about Islam. Would you believe this or no? If you go to Pakistan and India and you ask the people, what is your jurisprudence? And they reply to you, we are Hanafi. Say to them, did you know not only that Imam al-Sadiq taught Abu Hanifa, but that if Imam al-Sadiq used to be busy, Imam al-Kadhim at the age of five used to answer on his behalf. Abu Hanifa comes home one day to Imam al-Sadiq. He knocks at the door and Imam al-Sadiq emerges. When Imam al-Sadiq and Imam al-Kadhim emerges, when Imam al-Kadhim emerges, Abu Hanifa says to him, is your dad here? He said, yes, he is. He's just a bit busy. Abu Hanifa said, then I'll wait. Imam al-Kadhim said, no, is there anything I can help you with? Abu Hanifa said, no, no, I think your dad can answer it for me. He said, no, no, ask me. He said, young man, Musa, when we commit a sin, is it Allah who makes us sin? Is it us and Allah? Or is it us alone who commit a sin? It's a question many of us ask, isn't it? When I commit a sin, is Allah making me sin? Is it me and Allah? Or do I have the freedom of choice? Imam Musa ibn Ja'far said, Oh Abu Hanifa, 
And know one thing, that Abu Hanifa was at an old age when Imam Musa ibn Ja'far answered him with this. He said to him, Oh Abu Hanifa, if it is Allah who makes us commit a sin, then it's not fair he puts us in hell when he made us commit the sin. If it is us and Allah, once again it's not fair that we are punished when he was part of the crime. Therefore it is us who have been given the choice of free will. We can either stay away from sin or we can continue sinning. Imagine Abu Hanifa at his old age, Imam Musa ibn Ja'far at the age of five is already answering questions for him. Then on another occasion you find Abu Hanifa comes to Imam al-Sadiq one day. He says to him, Ja'far bin Muhammad, I saw your son Musa al-Kadhim praying today. I saw him, but I don't think he knows how to pray properly. Imam al-Sadiq looked at him and said, what do you mean? He said, when I walked past him in Salah, when someone walked past him in Salah, he didn't stick his hand out. Our brothers in other schools in Islam, if you walk past them in Salah, do not be surprised if their hand comes out like that. The reason is understandable that they say that you shouldn't walk past someone in Salah, try and walk behind them. Sometimes you will walk past, inadvertently you'll see someone who lets you put their hand out like that. So he said to Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, he said to Musa al-Kadhim, the young boy, doesn't know how to read his prayers properly. Go and teach him. Imam al-Sadiq said, oh Abu Hanifa, why don't you go and teach Imam al-Kadhim? Teach, you go and teach him. Abu Hanifa said, very well. He came to Imam Musa ibn Ja'far. Imam is young, five years old. He said to him, young man, I need to teach you about salah. Musa ibn Ja'far said to him, go ahead. He said, when someone walks past you in your salah, you must put your hand out and block them when they walk past you. Because I just saw someone walk past you now and you didn't bother blocking them. Imam Musa ibn Ja'far said, Oh Abu Hanifa, Allah says that he is closer to me than my jugular vein. While I was praying, I was so focused on my Lord, I didn't see any human being walk past me. Therefore you find at that young age, Imam Musa ibn Ja'far, from the student of his dad and his African mother Hamida, was able to achieve this prowess. And that's why many people were in awe of the young Imam Musa ibn Ja'far, I tell you. Many people used to love him because they saw a young man who had all the pleasures of the world in front of him, but went towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Holy Prophet used to say, Allah loves to see nothing more than a youth who turns away from all of these this forbidden acts and turns towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam Musa ibn Ja'far, at a young age, you find that there was a small house. People would say, when we walk past the small house, we We'd know that the young Musa ibn Ja'far would be in that house. And we could hear him reciting his prayers in the most beautiful voice. And you could see the tears coming down from his eyes. And you would hear him say, Ya Muhsin, Qad Atak al Musin. Oh, doer of good, and oh, you who is all good, the sinner has come to you. You find here that from that young age he was in this small house. And you know what the irony is? Imam Musa ibn Ja'far in that small house and you had the caliphs in his time in the largest of palaces. Imam Musa ibn Ja'far in that small house, the caliphs. Do you know how many caliphs he lived under? He lived under the caliph al-Saffah and Mansur and under al-Hadi and under al-Mahdi and under Harun Rashid. All of them had palaces. Wallah, if you go to Baghdad, go and see the palaces of all of these khulafa. You see, for example, Dar al Raqiq, you see Qasr al Khul, you see Qasr al Shakiriya. All of these palaces. And Imam Musa ibn Ja'far had a small house. Today in Baghdad, I ask you, those people, where are all their palaces? And look at the grand palace of Imam Musa ibn Ja'far. Imam Musa ibn Ja'far, therefore, at that young age, he had that ability where he was already in his closeness, in his piety, in his worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why, what do you find? You find Imam Musa ibn Ja'far was 20 years old when his father died. When Imam al-Sadiq died, Mansur tried to play a trick which Imam al-Sadiq destroyed him in. 
Mansur, when Imam al-Sadiq died, decided that these Imams have to be killed off from the beginning. There's no point letting them live. So Mansur wrote to his governor in Medina. He said, I have heard the news that Ja'far ibn Muhammad has died. Find out in his wasiyah who has he written to be the leader after him and behead the person. The governor in Medina was called Sulaiman. Sulaiman got the will of Imam al Sadiq. When he got the will, Sulaiman said, Let me look who's he written. Okay, Imam al Sadiq has done this. Make sure you pray salah, make sure you bury me, make sure, make sure. And my successor is. My successors are five. Mansur al Dawaniqi. Subhanallah. I tell you these Imams, Wallah, we have them as a source of pride. Successor number one, Mansur al-Dawaniqi. Number two, Sulaiman, the one who's reading it. This person, his face became blue after hearing this. Successor number three, Abdullah. Successor number four, Hamida. Successor number five, Imam Musa ibn Ja'far. Now Sulaiman is thinking, what do I do? As in number one, Mansur is saying, behead whoever's on this list. And I'm on this list. And Mansur's on the list. And Musa ibn Ja'far's on the list. And also Hamida, Imam al-Salaq's wife's on the list. Abdullah's on the list. So he wrote back to Mansur Dawaniqi. Mansur Dawaniqi said, has there any post come? Has there any post come? His servant said, yes. One letter came today. He said, give it to me quickly, quickly. The letter is Imam al sadiqs written down who his successor is meant to be. Mansur's like, continue. What does it say? What does it say? Mansur al Dawaniqi, number one. Sulaiman, number two. Abdullah. Mansur said, wait, wait, wait. What are you talking about? He said, Master, you said behead whoever it is. You're one of them. Mansur said, very well, leave these people alone. Leave them. Because if I have to behead the others, that means I have to get someone to behead me as well. If we're going to have to have the will, Alhamdulillah, Imam Musa ibn Ja'far, when this happened, was allowed to begin his imamah at the age of 20. And what do you find when he began his imamah? The first thing people noticed in his imamah was that he was a man man who was able to restrain his anger however much disrespect you showed him because i tell you when we say his title is al kadhim do you know what al kadhim means in the quran in chapter 3 verse 134 there is the verse which says wal kadhimin al ghayd kadhim means the one who is able to restrain his anger in a moment of difficulty. Imam Musa ibn Ja'far, when they called him al kadhim do you know why? Because when he received the Imam at the age of 20, there were people who used to insult him and curse him. And never in his life did he ever reply back to them. And that's why each one of us should be a kadhim there's no point saying Assalamu alayka ya Musa ibn Ja'far if we don't have al kadhim in our life. How many of us have an anger problem? When you look in the mirror, sometimes don't you admit you have an anger problem? And then when you have that anger problem, ask yourself, why am I not like my Imam Musa ibn Ja'far al kadhim When he was al kadhim Allah praised him by saying he's a man. When he's angry, he restrains. Because one day Imam Musa ibn Ja'far was walking, this man came up to him and said to him, curse on your father and on you. Honestly, how do you reply to people like this? I don't know, is this a human or an animal? Curse be on you and on your father. The companions of Imam Musa ibn Ja'far wanted to approach the man. Imam said, wait, 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 leave him, leave him. Finished. He said to me, curse on me and my father, leave him. A couple of days later, Imam Musa ibn Ja'far said, how do you think we should approach this man? And it is vital when we hear these stories of the Ahlul Bayt, let's implement their attributes in our life, please. al kadhim restraining our anger. He asked his companions, how should we treat this man who cursed Imam al sadiq and cursed me? They said, Imam, we should punish him. We should attack him. We should confiscate his... He said, no. He said, leave this man to me. 
A few days later, Imam walked towards the garden of this man. He inquired about him. They said he's in his garden. Imam walked towards the garden of this man. When he walked towards his garden, as he entered the garden, the man said, What are you doing here, you son of... Imam looked at him and said, what's the problem? He said, you've already damaged my garden with your footsteps. <laughs> Imam said to him, how much have you spent on this garden? He said, 100 dinar. He said, how much do you expect to make from it? He said, 200 dinar. He said, here, take. When the man counted it, it was exactly 300 dinar. The man looked at Imam al and he said, but look at the way I cursed you. I cursed Ja'far al-Sadiq and I cursed you. He said, we the Ahlul Bayt have been taught to instill akhlaq not only in the lives of the people but in our life as well. I could easily reply back to you, but I want you to understand that as humanity, we can never survive if each one of us is going to attack each other like that. People would call him Al-Kadhim, another person would say, Wallah, I saw him as Al-Kadhim when one day in his house, someone dropped water all over his Abba. And the person looked at him and said, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, al Imam said, I have restrained my anger. Imam said, I have forgiven you. Imam said, I have freed you for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That attribute of Imam al kadhim was at the beginning of his life and later he would need it when he was in prison for more than 15 years of his life. But it was that attribute where people would then respect him in his knowledge. Do you know why? If your akhlaq is good, people will listen to your knowledge. If your knowledge is good without akhlaq, no one will listen to you. Imam Musa ibn Ja'far first had to establish to the people that you can see my morals. Now trust me when I have knowledge. I am sincere in giving you this knowledge. That's why one day Imam Musa ibn Ja'far is walking. He goes past the house where music is being played. When he walks past the house where music is being played, he sees a lady sweeping the floor outside the house. He says to her, may I ask you a question? She says, go ahead. He said, is the owner of the house a free man or a slave? She said to him, of course, he is a free man. Imam replied, yes, definitely, because he, if he was a slave, he'd know which master was watching him. She heard him and she thought, you know, I've never thought about it like this. If truly I am an abd of Allah, then how am I not respecting my master by playing music at home? Do you know what the narration say? She went back in the house. Her husband said to her, what happened? She said, oh, I was just talking to someone outside. The husband said, what did the person say? She said, I don't know. He looked like a very humble man. And he just asked me a question. The husband said, what was the question? She said, the question was, is the owner of the house where music is being played? Is the owner of the house a free man or a slave? So I said to him, he's a free man. So he said, what did he say then? She said, I heard him say, yes, definitely he's a free man because if he was a slave, he'd know that the master was watching him. That person said, can you describe him to me? She said, yes. He had this complexion and this look and this beard and this height. He said, that is Musa ibn Ja'far. He ran out of the house without even wearing his slippers. He ran looked for Imam Musa ibn Ja'far until he found him. He said, oh Imam, forgive me. Wallah, I have never thought of music the way you said it. In the past, I heard people say music is haram, but it didn't convince me. But the way you described it makes sense. How can I play music in a house and I claim to be a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? That person, that person, do you know what the Imam said to him? He said, do not worry. If you regret it and you perform tawbah, Allah will forgive you. That person today, the Sufis respect him very highly. They call him Bishr al-Hafi. Al-Hafi in Arabic means the one who walks barefooted. They call him Bishr al-Hafi because he ran out of his house to Musa ibn Ja'far barefooted. But look at the lesson Imam Musa ibn Ja'far taught. He didn't say to him straight in his face, 
music is haram, you're going to be punished if you listen to music. No. He said, how in salah are you saying that you are an abd of Allah, yet in your house you are listening to the people who oppose Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Today, in Muslim households, or in Muslim weddings, or in Muslim gatherings, music, it's normal for a Muslim to come and play music. And when you see them and you say, what is this music that's being played? They say, well, you know what, at the end of the day, it's a celebration day, and it's a one-off occasion. I remember one scholar saying that, they said to me when I asked them on the first son's wedding, what is this? The father said, you know, it's my first son, please. When it was the second son, the father said, you know, it's my second son. When it was the third son, the father said, you know, this is the last one and that's it. There's none after this. You want to begin your first day in halal or in haram? You find Imam Musa ibn Ja'far said, is the house a person free or a slave? If he is a slave of Allah, he would never play such a thing. In other words, what did you find whenever Imam Musa ibn Ja'far would advise? There was a rational side to his advice. But truly, that aspect of him being kaadum was needed in his life. Why? Because I tell you, the amount of oppression they showed the Shia at that time was phenomenal. There has never been a period in Islamic history when the Shia of Al Muhammad has been oppressed like when Imam Musa ibn Ja'far was Imam. I tell you, if you were to read the Khulafa who he had to live under, Shia could not even practice their faith. Do you know how the Shia had to practice? They had to employ taqiyya. Taqiyya is when you conceal your belief because you are in a state of life or death. Amongst the people who had to perform taqiyya, because of that time, you found many of the great companions of Imam al kadhim Ibrahim al jafi Ahmed al-Halabi, Ahmed al-Bazanti, amongst others, had to conceal their faith because of Imam Musa ibn Ja'far and because of the caliphs of the time. Because you know what these caliphs were doing? These caliphs were terrorizing any Shia of Al-Muhammad. Do you know Imam al rabah has a hadith? When I read it, I couldn't believe the hadith. And tomorrow, inshallah, we discuss Imam al rabah Imam al rabah says that if it wasn't for the event of Karbala, the worst tragedy to have affected our Ahlul Bayt was the tragedy of Fakh. When I read Fakh, I decided to go and do my research. What is the tragedy of Fakh? For Imam al rabah to say the worst tragedy which affected our Ahl al-Bayt was the tragedy of Fakh. Da'bal bin Ali al-Khuzai even has poetry about their graves in Fakh. Do you know what happened in Fakh? After Al-Mansur died, who became the caliphs? You had the brothers, you had Hadi and Mahdi. Hadi al-Abbasi had a governor in Medina who used to oppress the Shia so much that he made them every morning and every evening, if you were a Shia living in Medina, you had to come to his palace and sign up. Sign up, what does sign up mean? Means you literally just have to come sign your name so he knows that what you're doing or where you're hiding or what your movements are. Every Shia, man, woman, child has to come in the morning, has to come in the evening and sign in the palace. In that time, the cousins of Imam Musa ibn Ja'far, Hussein bin Ali al-Khair, Hassan al-Aftas, this governor of Medina, the governor of Hadi, caught Hassan al-Aftas and whipped him 200 times in public for being a follower of Ahlul Bayt. And on top of that, he spread out to the people that this man, because we caught him drinking, we have to punish him and we need to parade his body on a donkey. Hussein ibn Ali al Khair, cousin of Imam Musa al Kadhim, went to this governor. He said, Listen, number one, I know my cousin was not drinking. Number two, the punishment for drinking alcohol in Islam is 80 lashes. Why have you punished him 200 lashes? Number three, in Islam, you don't parade a body on a donkey. 
That person said to him, who are you to speak to me like that? You and your Shia can't even practice your faith in my time. You have to come to my palace in the morning and in the evening. Get out. This Hussein bin Ali al-Khair decided to tell all the Shia, rise. Let's not sit and watch. This person is torturing us and we should not just sit there and watch this oppression. The narration was that Hassan al-Aftas went to the top of this man's palace. He removed him. He said, Hayya ala salah Everyone rise. The family of Ahlul Bayt rose under the leadership of Hussein and Hussein's sister Zainab. Do you see how history repeats itself? A hundred years after Karbala, Hussein from the grandsons, Zainab from the granddaughters. This Hussein raises all of Al Muhammad. 232 members of Al Muhammad went to rise against these people. And you know what that Hussein told Zainab? Subhanallah, how history repeats itself. Hussein told Zainab, he said to her, my sister Zainab, when the blood reaches your ankles, then this paper of our followers, let it go with the blood because we don't want our followers, if we die, to be caught. When Hussein got killed, that governor, do you know what he did? He took all the children of Al Muhammad who survived. He took them to Baghdad to the Khalid of the time Al Hadi. All these children were sitting in front of Al Hadi. Imagine you've got lots of children of Ahlul Bayt, grandchildren of Bibi Fatima. All of them in front of Al Hadi. Al Hadi looked at them, he said, Who's these? They said, The grandkids of Fatima al Zahra. He said, Oh, they are the ones related to Musa ibn Ja'far? He said, Yes. He said, Very well, bring me a sword. They said to him, what are you going to do? He said, I want you to make them all stand next to each other. Let's see how many heads I can cut at the same time. Oh. Today you have followers of Ahlul Bayt who say it's hard for me to be religious. I tell them you don't know an inch of those who came before you. He got his sword and he beheaded them one by one, the grandchildren of Fatima al Zahra. <laughs> Imam al Rada said, Were it not for the incident of Karbala, the worst incident to affect us was the incident of Fakh. <laughs> Graves which survived in Fakh. When this Hadi, he told everyone there, he said, I swear this whole uprising is because of Musa ibn Ja'far. Abu Yusuf al-Qadi was there, he said, no, Musa ibn Ja'far, I can swear on my children. Musa ibn Ja'far did not tell anyone to rise. This Hadi said, don't worry, I'll find Musa ibn Ja'far and I'll kill him. The narrations, what do they say to us? The narrations say, the people of Musa ibn Ja'far said to him, that Imam, do you know who said this to him? Yaqteen, the father of Ali bin Yaqteen, yes? Yaqeen said, Imam, be careful. This Al-Hadi Al-Abbas, he wants to come and find you and he wants to kill you. The narrations come and say to us that Imam Musa ibn Ja'far said, let me just recite Salah. He went to recite Salah. Then he recited Dua Jawshan al saghir Then after finishing Jawshan al saghir he said, do not worry. You will hear news shortly that Al-Hadi Al-Abbas has just died. The news then came, Ali Abbas had just passed away. After Al-Hadi Al-Mahdi, after Al-Mahdi, to treat an Imam of Ahlul Bayt, Harun al Rashid. Harun al Rashid, if he found out you were Shia, you were beheaded. Harun al Rashid would not allow anyone to come out and say they were Shia. Do you know how they used to have Majalis in those days? Look at us today, Alhamdulillah. Thousands of people sitting in a lecture, listening to the Majalis of Ahlul Bayt. Do you know in those days what they would do? You would sell butter. While you're selling the butter, you teach your fellow Shia about Ahlul Bayt. As soon as the guard of Harun al Rashid walks past, you then say, Okay, three kilograms of butter, I will get it for you, don't worry. And that's why some of the greatest companions of Imam al Kadhim, when Harun al Rashid put Imam al Kadhim in prison, some of his greatest companions had to come and ask him, What shall we do? Amongst them, Bu'lul. 
You think Bahlul is a simple companion? Bahlul was a student of Imam al-Sadiq and Imam al-Kadhim. Bahlul came to Imam al-Kadhim in prison. He said, Imam, him and two other companions. They came to Imam al-Kadhim, they said, Imam, you are in prison. What shall we do? We your followers. How do we spread your word? Imam said, Jim. Jim. Imam said, Jim. The first one thought, Jim, part of the Arabic alphabet, Alif, Ba, Ta, Tha, Jim. The first one thought, Jim means Jabal, mountains. So he went to live in the mountains. The second one thought, Jim, Jala, Adil, Watan. So he went to live in another country. Bahlul said, I know what Jim is. Jim is Junoon. I'm going to act Majnoon. Crazy. But in my insanity, I will spread the word of Musa ibn Ja'far. Do you know what a sacrifice it is to act insane so you protect the teachings of an Imam? Do you know what sacrifice that is? I don't think we know. We don't know what that sacrifice is, brothers and sisters. We today, when you ask us to be religious, I'm not ready yet. Ready. You think anyone's waiting for you? This ship has sailed. If you've studied the lives of the Imams and you're still thinking, I'm not ready yet. Oops, no one, move away. Rather look at someone like Bahlul and say, Bahlul has to act insane to preserve the teachings. And Wallah Bahlul, the way he used to act. You would see a man who acts insane, but his words are words of wisdom. One day, Bahlul, is sitting down on the throne of Harun al-Rashid. And he's jumping up and down, jumping, jumping. The people came, they started hitting him. Bahlul, get off. And he kept on jumping and jumping on the throne. All of a sudden, they came, they hit him and they removed him. He began to cry. Harun al-Rashid walked in. He looked at Bahlul crying, he said, why is Bahlul crying? The God said, oh, our master, he's crying because he was sitting on your throne. And how dare anyone sit on the throne of our master? Harun she said, Bahlul, is that why you're crying? He said, no. He said, then why? He said, I cry for someone like you. How could you sit on the throne of the sons of Fatima to Zahra? What will you answer your Lord on the day of judgment? And then all of a sudden, he'll run away on a broomstick. Harun she would look at him and think, this guy's crazy, but will also know the bullet hit. On another occasion, Bahlul tells Harun Rashid, give me the keys to the prisons of Baghdad, please give me them. Harun Rashid said, what do you want to do with them? He said, I just want to play, I just want to play. Harun Rashid said, okay, take them. An hour later, the guards come. Harun, there is trouble. Harun Rashid said, what's the trouble? He says, all the prisoners have been released. Harun said, oh my God, Bahlul. Where is Bahlul? They said, he's in the graveyard, he's sitting down. Harun Rashid came up to me, saw Bahlul crying, he's like, Bahlul, didn't I tell you don't mess about with these keys? Why did you release them? Bahlul said, please, I'm sorry, please. Bahlul then said, is there any way I can be forgiven? Harun Rashid said, yes. Bahlul said, what is it? He said, if you make sure they're all caught, then I'll forgive you. Bahlul said, very well, let's stay in this graveyard because there'll be a day when all of them will come here. <laughs> Harun Rashid one day tells Bahlul, Bahlul, you are insane. I know you're crazy. But sometimes you say some extraordinary things. I don't know where you got them from. He doesn't know he got them from Musa al-Kadhim. He said to him, Bahlul, you know there is Sarat on the day of judgment, on Qiyamah. How will it feel when we're on that Sarat to heaven or hell? Bahlul said, I don't know. He said, no, no, tell me. He said, okay, I do know. He said, what is it? He said, get me a pot. He said, okay, I'll get you a pot. He bought the pot. He said, put some water in the pot. He put some water in the pot. He then said to him, light a fire under it, let it boil. Harun says, okay, we boil the water, there is fire. My Lord said, now put a plate on top of it, on top of the pot. Harun said, okay, I'll put this big plate. My Lord said, now we have to play a game. He said, what is it? 
He said, I have to stand on the pot and I have to say what I eat every day and what I drink every day and what I own in this dunya. And I have to say it, but I can't get off even though the fire is under me. And then you have to get on and you have to say what you eat and what you drink and what you own in this dunya. So Bahlul got on. He said, my name is Bahlul. I eat a bit of bread. I drink a bit of water. And I don't own anything in this dunya. And he got off. <laughs> now it's your turn. My name is Harun Rashid. I drink alcohol and I drink and I also eat I eat I eat I eat that you jumped off Bello said what's wrong we didn't even get to the things you own and you jumped off already so he said to him what do you mean he said I just get boiled a bit of fire and you couldn't handle it how will you handle the Salat when Allah asks you about your life <laughs> in other words this Bello do you think he acted insane because he wants to no human wants to act insane but he knew Imam Musa ibn Ja'far told him so he preserves the teachings of Ahlul Bayt. Likewise, Ali bin Yaqeen, Ali bin Yaqeen was the minister for Harun al Rashid. First, when he came towards Ahlul Bayt, he wrote a letter to Imam al Kalam. He said, Imam, how do us, the followers of Ahlul Bayt, do our wudu? Imam Musa al Kalam wrote back to him, he said, We perform our wudu by washing our face, and then washing our hands, and then wiping our head, and then washing our feet. Yaqeen said, when I read the letter, I'm like, washing our feet? We don't wash our feet. We wipe our feet. But Imam Musa the Ja'far would not make a mistake. So what do I do? Do I wash or do I wipe? Someone who was jealous of Ali bin Yaqeen told Harun al-Rashid, I think, I think, that Ali bin Yaqeen is a lover of Musa al-Kaf. Rashid said to him, why? He said, because I've seen him talk about him. And he talks about him in a pleasant way. Har Rashid said, Ali bin Yaqeen would never leave my way. This is not true. That person said, no it is, I promise you it is. Harun Rashid said, very well, tomorrow I will found, I find out. The person said, how? He said, we'll go and spy on Ali bin Yaqeen in Wudu. <laughs> You know there's a moment in your life where you either unconditionally submit to your Imam or you pick and choose what of Islam you like, isn't it? Thank you. Ali bin Yaqeen is reading a letter where Musa ibn Ja'far says to him, Wash! Ali bin Yaqeen knows you have to wipe. But if Musa ibn Ja'far says, Wash! Then you have to wash. Harun and Rashid is watching through the window. Ali bin Yaqeen is doing his wudu. Washes his face, washes his hands, wipes his head. And now the crunch time. Do I listen to my Imam or do I make up my own Islam? As he's coming to his feet, he says, I have to listen to my Imam. He began washing his feet. Harun Rashid said, I told you he hasn't joined Musa al -Kadam. Look, he washes his feet like we wash our feet. <laughs> imam directed them that do not worry if I'm in prison, you can be my representatives when I'm away. And that's why when people today say to me, Sayyid Ammar, we are in, with an Imam who's in Ghaybah. We already had an Imam called Musa ibn Ja'far in Ghaybah. And do you know why he put him in prison? You know why Harun Rashid put him in prison? Two acts, two reasons. The first reason is Harun Rashid looked at Imam Musa ibn Ja'far one day. He said to him, why do you, the sons of Ali ibn Abi Talib, think you're better than us, the sons of Abbas? Remember, these are cousins. Imam al kadhim is from the line of Abu Talib. Harun Rashid is from the line of Abbas. Abu Talib and Abbas are brothers. But sometimes cousins can hate each other, not just love each other. The narration state that Harun Rashid said, why do you think you're better than us? Imam Musa ibn Ja'far said, Harun, we come from Abu Talib, you come from Abbas. Rasulullah's father Abdullah is from the same father and mother as Abu Talib. Whereas Abbas's mother is different. 
Harun al-Rashid said then, but Abu Talib died and Abbas remained alive. And the heritage of Rasulullah remains with Abbas, not Abu Talib. Imam al-Kadhim said yes, but the heritage of Rasulullah remains in his child, not in his uncle. And we are the sons of Fatima. At that moment, Imam al-Kadhim said, O oh Harun al-Rashid, if Rasulullah came to propose for your daughter, would you give your daughter to him? Harun al-Rashid said, yes, it would be my honor. Imam said, but he wouldn't for us because he is the father of our mother. He would never come to us. Therefore, our line is a straight connection, whereas yours is an indirect connection. Harun al-Rashid was not happy with this. It brought an envy, but he still needed a rumor to be spread. Do you know who he paid to spread a rumor about Imam al-Kadhim? Imam's brother Ismail had a son called Ali. You know, today in the Muslim world, we have different sects. We have the Zaydis, the Ismailis, we have the Imami Isna Asharis. And Ismail was the brother of Imam al kadhim but from a different mother. The narrations, what do they say to us? The narrations say to us, Ismail had a son by the name of Ali. Yahya al-Barmaki told this Ali that we will pay you a certain amount of money. And by the way, Ismail died before Imam al-Sadiq. Ismail died before Imam al-Sadiq. Some of the Shia of the time believed because Ismail is the eldest son, that means he should be the Imam after. And even if he's dead, his son should be the Imam. Whereas we say in the school of Ahlul Bayt, it doesn't mean because you're the eldest son, you should be the Imam. It's who Allah has chosen who should be the Imam. And even Ismail, Yahya al-Barmaki told him, we'll pay you a certain amount of money if you come from Medina to Baghdad and you spread rumors about Musa the Ja'far. <laughs> The narrations say, Ali bin Ismail, Imam Musa ibn Ja'far's nephew, just before he left, Imam said to him, where are you going? He said, I'm going to Baghdad. He said, why? He said, I have debts which I need to pay. Imam said, Ali, I'll pay your debts. You don't need to go to Baghdad. The narrations say, Ali said, no, I want to go. Give me a piece of advice, oh my uncle. Imam said, do not be the cause of the bloodshed of me and my family. And then he said, Ali, here's 300 dinar. One of Imam's companions said, Imam, why did you give him 300 dinar? Don't you know this man, what he's going to do? Imam said, Rasul Allah used to say, look after your relatives. If you look after your relatives, if your relatives do evil to you later, that's Allah's concern, not yours. You do good to your relatives. What they do after, Allah will judge them. You know this Ali? He went all the way to Harun al-Rashid. Harun al-Rashid was sitting down. Yahya al-Barmaki was sitting down. Harun al-Rashid said, what is it, Ali? He said, do you know this Musa ibn Ja'far? He's sitting in Medina. He's collecting weapons. And he's raising an army to kill you. All for money. Imam Musa ibn Ja'far didn't raise any army. He didn't have any weapons. Harun al-Rashid said, oh people, did you hear this? They said, yes. He said, now do you allow me to put him in my prisons? The people said, yes. Ali bin Ismail, Imam al-Kadhim's nephew said, can I have my envelope? He gave him the envelope. When he went out to open the envelope, do you know how much was in the envelope? 200 dinar. How much did Imam al-Kadhim give him? 300. When he saw the 200, he couldn't believe it. He choked and he died at that moment. He let down his uncle and from there Harun al-Rashid took over Imam al-Kadhim's life. <laughs> Imam al-Kadhim, they moved him from prison to prison. More than 15 years he spent in prison. The first prison was in Basra. Then they took him to Qantara prison. Then they took him to the prison of Fadl ibn al-Rabi'ah. Do you know Fadl ibn al-Rabi'ah? Do you know one day what he said? You know Imam Musa al-Kadhim when he first entered prison, you know what his first words were? Ya Allah, all my life I have asked you to give me the honor of worshipping you in a place alone. I now thank you that you've given me this honor. Would you say that if you were in prison? Would you? Ya Allah, all my life I've asked you to let me be in a place where I can worship you alone. Now thank you. Would you say that? Prison makes a human being get destroyed sometimes. 
Fadl ibn al-Rabi' when Imam Musa al-Kadhim was moved from Basra prison, then to Qantara prison, then to Fadl ibn Rabi'ah's prison. Fadl ibn Rabi'ah told Ahmed al-Qazwini, he said to him, Ahmed, come with me to my prison. So he came. He said, what do you see in the prison? He said, I see a man. I see a white robe. He said, no, 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 look closer. He said, no, I see a white robe. He said, no, that's Musa ibn Ja'far in sujood. The whole time in prison, he studies in his sujood. He says, Harun al-Rashid sent the most beautiful girl in the whole of Arabia into Musa ibn Ja'far's prison. And when she entered the prison, she said to Musa ibn Ja'far, Oh man, whatever you want from me, I'll give you. And he didn't reply. Whatever you want, I'll give you. And he didn't reply. The third time she said, Please, whatever you want, I'll give you. The Khalifa sent me. She says that he turned around to me and he said, Oh lady, why would I want what you offer when Allah has offered more? He said, By the time the guards entered the prison, they saw Musa ibn Ja'far in sujood and the lady behind him in sujood. And he sent people into the prison who didn't speak Arabic. They came out as Muslims. He said, what's wrong with you? You people were meant to kill Musa ibn Ja'far. They said, the man started speaking to us in our language. And we became Muslims from his words. Fadl ibn Rabi'a used to say, how can I torture a man? In the daytime he is fasting, in the night he is praying. Then after that, they took him to the prison of Fadl bin Yahya until at the end, they took him to the prison of As-Sindi. As-Sindi. Do you know what his prison was? May Allah bless the soul of Imam Musa ibn Ja'far. All those years in prison. You know what his prison was? The other prisons, they were tight spaces. As-Sindi's prison, was the type of prison where it's a narrow pole and they make you stand inside it so that you can't sit. And on top of that pole they put a rock so that you could not know the difference between day and night. And Imam Musa ibn Ja'far used to say to the guards, I do not know the difference between the day and the night. When you want to pray your salah, I beg you come and tell me so I can at least attempt to pray my salah. And you know there is a hadith which is a hadith which hurts you. That the one day they removed the rock, the time when they'd removed the rock from the top of his pole where he was in, he tried to look outside for some of the daylight. All of a sudden, a man came and smacked him and hit him with his legs. And they began to kick the face of Imam Musa ibn Ja'far. Do you know how many people visit Imam Musa ibn Ja'far and don't cry by his grave? Do you know? Because they say, we don't know anything about his life. No! was tortured like Musa ibn Ja'far. No Imam. Aba Abdullah, there is no day like Aba Abdullah. But there are no years like Imam Musa al kadhim And at the end, Imam Musa al kadhim in prison is the only Imam. And I say, Ya Allah, I don't know how much they tortured Imam al kadhim in prison. But imagine an Imam. Normally, Imams of Ahl al-Bayt can take anything. Imagine Imam al kadhim his last dua in prison, Ya Allah. All my years, I asked you to allow me to worship you alone. And I thank you for that honor. But Ya Allah, I beg you now, release me from the prison of Harun. <laughs> So Ibn Suwayd narrates, Ali Ibn Suwayd narrates, I came to Imam al kadhim I got through to his prison. I spoke to him, I said, Imam Musa ibn Ja'far, when are you coming out? Your Shia are waiting. <laughs> and Imam Musa ibn Ja'far said, Oh Ali, on Friday in the morning on the bridge of Baghdad, I will be out. <laughs> you know where I am heading. <laughs> Ali says, I went and told all our Shia, Imam Musa ibn Ja'far is going to be released. Let's all gather on the Friday on the bridge of Baghdad. He 
say is on the Friday we went to the bridge of Baghdad and we heard a man saying there is a janazah here. He said we went and we saw a body lying on the ground on the bridge of Baghdad. He said we came towards the body we were wondering whose body is this. When we came near the body we saw it was Imam Musa ibn Ja'far's body on the bridge. He says we came near the body. He said I had a, a, a doctor who was a Christian. I said to the doctor, oh doctor come and look at this body. When the doctor came and looked at this body, the doctor looked at me and he said, does this man have any family? I said to him, why? He said, because they should ask for blood money. I said, why? He said, because the poison had surrounded his whole body. And that's why I tell you a story which I know of first hand. Sheikh Ahmed Al Wa'ili, may Allah bless his soul, one of the greatest reciters in Islamic history. He himself narrates in Baghdad, one day I came home, my daughter, I saw her and I saw my wife crying. What's the problem? My daughter was playing with glass and the glass went through the eye and the whole eye opened up. So I went and got a doctor and the doctor said, your daughter will never see with this eye again. He said, I straight away thought I'm going to Imam Musa ibn Ja'far's grave in Baghdad. May Allah grant you all that honor of that ziyarah. He said, I went to the grave of Imam Musa ibn Ja'far. I stood by the grave. I said, oh Imam, I have sent you a Bab al It Show me now. My daughter's eye is cut, she cannot see it. He says, Wallah, I returned home and my wife was smiling. I said to her, what is it? She said, look at your daughter. He said, I looked at my daughter, her eye was back in the same state again. He said, that day I realized the meaning of Bab al Hawa'ij Imam Musa ibn Ja'far. That when the Christian doctor came back, he saw her eye, he said, I cannot believe that the eye has come back like this. The eye was completely cut and now it's back to normal. Therefore, do not forget on a night like this to ask through Imam Musa ibn Ja'far. Ask your Hawa'ij on a night like this. Raise your hands, brothers and sisters. Raise your hands if you can. Raise your hands and we pray to Allah to raise us with Imam Musa. Ibn Ja'far, the man who in his ziyarah we say, O oh man who was put in the prisons of Harun al Rashid. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all our Muslim brothers around the Islamic world, especially our brothers in Bahrain and all our brothers who are facing hardship in the world today. We pray to Allah to raise us with Imam Musa ibn Ja'far alayhi salam to allow us to receive his intercession in this world and the hereafter. For all our brothers who are ill, we pray to Allah in the name of the one who was ill at Karbala, Imam Zain al Abidin. We pray to Allah with the following dua Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim, Amma yujib al Muthar, Ida da'a wa yakshav al Su, Amma yujib al Muthar, Ida da'a wa yakshav al Su, Amma yujib al Muthar, Ida da'a wa yakshav al Su, Amma yujib al Muthar, Ida da'a wa yakshav al Su, من يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء. إن شاء الله tomorrow we will continue with the biography of Imam Ali ibn Musa Rida. We pray to Allah سبحانه وتعالى the Surah Al-Fatiha, but before it the loudest of your salawat.
But there is one other ma'asum that I noticed when I was a young child that whenever his name was mentioned, my grandfather would not be able to control his tears. And it's Imam Musa ibn Ja'far. So one day I asked him that what is, what is so special about Musa ibn Ja'far that every time he's mentioned you cry? So he told me a story that I will never forget until the day they put me in my grave. He said to me that when I was a young child, my grandfather was born in Baghdad. His house was close to the haram of Imam al kazim He says, when I was a child, I used to play in the courtyard of Imam al kazim He says, when I was eight years old, I became very sick. And when I became sick, everybody thought it was the flu, that it's gonna pass after one or two days. He told me that I was not getting better. One day, two days, a week would go by, I was getting worse. And I became so sick that I wasn't even able to go to school. They took me from doctor to doctor. This is, I'm talking in the 1930s. He says, they took me from doctor to doctor and no one knew what was wrong with me. It became so bad that they told my mother that your son is finished. He's gonna die. So he says, I was laying in my bed, I couldn't move, I had become paralyzed. Can you imagine a mother who has spent months taking her eight-year-old son from doctor to doctor and everyone is telling her, we don't know what's wrong with him, he's gonna die. Prepare for his death. So his mother, who is my great-grandmother, she went home, she put on her hijab, and she went barefoot to the shrine of Imam al kazim You know when you're in, when you're mudhtar, when you have no one else, she went barefoot to the shrine of Imam Musa ibn Ja'far. And she went to his dhariyah. And she said to him, Ya ibn Rasulullah, my son is gonna die. I have no one to turn to. And I named him after you. My grandfather's name was Kazim. She says, I named him after you. I'm asking you to help my son. So she came home. That night, she had a dream. My grandfather's telling me this story, and I've heard it from many family members. That night she had a dream. She was sitting in her home. She heard a knock on the door, in the dream. She went to the door and she opened the door. She saw a Sayyid wearing a black turban and she said that I have never seen anyone more beautiful with more nur and this person said to her that Musa ibn Ja'far sent me to you and he says to you take him to Saint Mary hospital he mentions the name of the hospital in the dream. There is a doctor there who can cure your son. So she woke up. Can you imagine seeing a dream like this? She woke up and she asked, is there a hospital in Baghdad? Because she took him everywhere. Is there a hospital in Baghdad by this name? No one heard of it. So she asked and asked and asked until they told her that, oh, there is. There is a small private hospital in one of the suburbs of Baghdad with that name. So she immediately, she carries my grandfather. She says, bring him. Everybody thought that she's crazy. What do you mean a dream? What is this hospital? She says, no, no. Imam Musa ibn Ja'far told me to take him. My grandfather told me that they carried me. I was limp. I couldn't even walk. 
they carried me and they took me there and that week there was a visiting physician from Germany they brought him right when he saw my grandfather he said I know what it is he says he checked him and there was an accumulation of fluid in his spine he removed the fluid from his spine and within a matter of days he was healed so when he was telling me the story he says I owe my life to Musa ibn Ja'far and you would have never been born if it was not for Musa ibn Ja'far salawatullahi alayhi السلام عليك يا عين الله في خلقه السلام عليك يا نور الله الذي يهتدي به المهتدون ويفرج به عن المؤمن السلام عليك أيها المهذب الخائف السلام عليك أيها الولي السلام عليك يا سفينة النجاة السلام عليك يا عين الحياة السلام عليك صلى الله عليك وعلى آل بيتك الطيبين الطاهرين السلام عليك عجل الله لك ما بعدك من النصر وظهور الآن السلام عليك يا مولاي أنا مولاك عارف بأولاك وأخراك أتقرب إلى الله تعالى بك وبآل بيتك وأنتظر ظهورك وظهور الحق على يدك وأسأل الله أن يصلي على محمد وآل محمد وأن يجعلني من المنتظرين لك والتابعين والناصرين لك على أعدائك والمستشهدين بين يديك في جملة أوليائك يا مولاي يا صاحب الزمان صلوات الله عليك وعلى آل بيتك هذا يوم الجمعة وهو يومك المتوقع فيه ظهورك والفرج فيه للمؤمنين على يديك وقتل الكافرين وأنا يا مولاي فيه ضيفك وجارك وأنت يا مولاي كريم من أولاد الكرام ومأمور بالضيافة والإجارة فأضفني وأجرني صلوات الله عليك وعلى أهل بيتك الطيبين We have some breaking news coming in to CNN right now. 
Apparently thousands of Muslims are heading towards Mecca, Islam's holy city. After a man has emerged announcing himself as the promised Messiah, scenes of euphoria and celebration are being seen in cities across the world, as Muslims refer to this as the arrival of Mahdi, claiming him to be the savior of mankind. On the night of Ashura, Al-Imam Al-Mahdi will be in Mecca. 313 of his close companions will be gathered around him in the Grand Mosque in Masjid Al-Haram. Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala will bring them to the Imam. So this is his closest inner circle. When he starts his revolution, he starts it with these 313. So he prays Salat al-Maghrib and Isha. After Salat al-Isha, he stands by the Kaaba. His 313 companions are around him. He makes a universal message. He gives a speech in Masjid al-Haram. We have the content of the Imam's speech documented by our Imams. They have told us, foretold us what he will say. The narration states that the Imam will introduce himself by addressing creation. And the reason why he addresses creation as opposed to say Muslims or Shia or let's say monotheists is because his role is universal for everyone. And so therefore he needs to address everyone and everything in creation in order for them to begin their reconciliation with him and his movement for them. So he will address the world. He will make a number of points briefly. First of all, he will say that we, the family of Ahlul Bayt, we have long been persecuted. God has given us a status, a position, but our enemies have denied us that position. Number one. Number two, I am the closest one to the prophets of God. If you want to argue with me about Adam, I am the closest one to Adam. If you want to argue with me about Ibrahim and his teachings, I am the closest one to Ibrahim. If you want to argue with me about Musa, Isa, the Prophet I represent them. I carry their message. I am their inheritor. Then the Imam makes a global invitation. Whoever would like to join us in this global revolution, to establish justice, you are more welcome. The Imam السلام, invites Muslims specifically to revive the teachings of the Quran. He will tell them that you have abandoned the book of God, you have abandoned the Quran. Now it's the opportunity to revive the teachings of the Quran. So if you would like to join us, we have now started the journey. He gives his speech. He also makes references to Imam Al Hussein. He says, my grandfather, Imam al Hussein, was unjustly killed. And I am here to seek revenge by establishing justice. Because why was Imam al Hussein killed? Because he represented justice. So I'm continuing that message. So he does come to avenge the death of Imam Hussein. I am 
uh, the, the replica, the remnant of the prophets. If you want to see the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, look to me. If you want to see Ali ibn Abi Talib, look to me. That is because all of these Muslims with their variety, all of these monotheists of various persuasions with their variety, will all look backward to those historic figures. The Imam will use that to his advantage to state whatever you believe about the greatness of Musa alayhi salam as a Jew, whatever you believe about the profundity, the supremacy of Isa alayhi salam as a Christian, I am that in its entirety, not partial, in its entirety. So look to me for that justice. And that will be the inspiring moment that so many people will look to. Despite his long age, because up until now he's about 11 centuries old, but the Imam will not look old. Our ahadith indicate he will look like a 40-year-old man. So not an old man, a middle-aged man. These will be his looks. He will have that Arabian look because the Imam السلام, does come from the family of Quraysh, from the Ahlul Bayt, who were Arabs. So he will have that you know, Arabian look and complexion. One hadith states the Imam السلام, will look like a full moon or uh, another beautiful uh, tradition states that he will shine like a star so the Imam السلام, will be very attractive in his looks uh, people will recognize glory majesty in his looks they will recognize piety and faith you know that symbolic light that will surround his his face he will be wearing the clothes of the Prophet وآله, that he inherited. So the garment of the Prophet, the shirt of the Prophet, specifically the shirt that the Prophet wore at the battle of Uhud. The Imam السلام, will be wearing uh, the clothes of the Prophet. So he will really resemble the Prophet وآله, in, his, in his complexion, in his physical features. The Imam السلام, will look like his forefathers, he will be a descendant of an Arab genealogy. He will also have had, for three or four generations before that, uh, North African mothers who will probably bring about a darker skin tone to him. He will be 40 years old or look at the equivalent of a 40 year old. He will have the stocky trend and so on and so forth. When we talk about the ma'rif of the Imam, these are not ways to recognize the Imam. And too often, again, because the hadith mentions A, B, and C, we get bogged down into thinking this is how we need to recognize the Imam. Imagine now you're from China. This man is of typical Arab descent. If you get bogged down in his features, you may think he's not a savior for you because he doesn't represent your world. And so, when those narrations are being given, I question as to what extent they are seen in terms of an Arab context. Whereas the Imam alayhi salam elsewhere in a hadith is mentioned as being like water. Why? Because water runs everywhere. Water is universal. Water is colorless. Water is not biased in the way in which you see it. You have to put something to the water to make it change. In the same way, why the Imam is called like water? Because of his universality. And it will be less about his physical appearance that brings people towards him. Now, if I get bogged down in the physical appearance, when false Imams stand up and they say, I am the Imam. If I get bogged down to the physical appearance of what the Imam looks like, I may choose that false Imam. Or if I'm of a different physical appearance, and I don't recognize the Imam because of physical appearance, I will have rejected the right Imam. Both scenarios can take place. According to authentic narrations, when the news of the Mahdi's return reaches the Sufyani in Syria, he will order his army to advance from Medina towards Mecca with the hope of assassinating the Mahdi. However, when the army reaches an area called al Bayda in the Arabian desert, the ground will split and engulf the entire army. The incident is known as al khasf al bayda and is amongst the definite signs of the return of the Mahdi.
So now the Imam السلام, starts on his mission. Once that army is out of his way, the Imam, peace be upon him, is waiting now for his second circle of supporters. His first inner circle was how many? 313. The second is 10,000. 10,000 supporters who are not as high ranking as the 313, but they are sincere and dedicated.